Welcome. Good to have you all here this morning. Well, it's the Christmas season, isn't it? And you uh, hear a lot about Christmas. You hear Christmas songs all the time and everything. And, and as I was thinking about that, you know, one of the things that's very common is we think about the shepherds out in the field. And we think about uh, as the angel came to them and, and told them, you know, there's this um, baby born in Bethlehem and you should go see him and then it says that there was a host of angels a multitude of a heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill toward men I want to focus this morning on praise you know Jesus came into this earth and immediately there was praise one of the first things we learn is there was praise for him. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 61, I ran across something sometime, sometime back about putting on praise, putting on the garment of praise, and that's what I want to focus on this morning. We find it in Isaiah 61, and this is a prophetic scripture about Jesus coming. The first uh, couple of verses are, in fact, Jesus quoted himself in uh, the book of Luke. The first verse and half of the second verse, he quoted about himself. And then the the last part of of chapter, or verse 2 and verse 3 is about his second coming. And uh, so I want to read the first three verses here in Isaiah chapter 61. It says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planning of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Okay, I want to focus on that one phrase, a garment of praise. What is that? Why does he refer to praise as a garment? You know, um, what is a garment? You know, we think about, well, it's clothes. It's something you put on, right? I'm glad you guys have your garments on this morning. And... uh, you know, God made the very first garments. Think of Adam and Eve in the garden. And God made them garments. It says he took animal skins and he made them some clothes. And uh, for obvious reasons, to cover them up. There's actually three different purposes for garments, if we think about it. There's three different purposes. One is to cover something. Um, your garments protect you. When you go out in the cold, you put on a heavier garment. You put on a coat to protect your body, right? If you're in Alaska, you need a, a parka, you know, you need a thick coat to protect you from the cold. That's a garment. If you're an astronaut, you go out into outer space, you need a different type of a garment to protect you from the elements out there. So a garment is to cover something, it's to cover your body. And that's one of the reasons for a garment. Another reason for a, gar- a garment is to show a position or office that a person holds. You know, some preachers and some judges wear long garments today to show the position that they're in. If you're called before a judge, he will have a robe on, right? That shows he's the judge. He's the person in authority. That garment is there for that specific purpose, to show his position or office. And another type of garment is to show some important event that's happening. Um, When you got married... You ladies, you probably wore a wedding dress, right? It was a certain type of garment to show who the bride is, to show uh, that some important event is happening. Um, Students, when they graduate, they wear a a graduation gown, right? we got some people here, I believe, that work at a place where they make those graduation gowns. It's It's a garment for a specific purpose that shows an event that's happening and what they're doing there. You know, in the Bible... A garment was very important. It told a lot about what was happening. It told a lot about the person. Um, Here's some examples. 
A garment of pure white linen showed all Egypt that Joseph was in command. A purple garment was only for a king. A black garment was for widows mourning for their husbands. A garment of sackcloth, think gunny sack, was for those in grief and great loss. A colorful garment was provided for each wedding guest by wealthy hosts. A garment for shepherds was made of skins. The garment for soldiers was red. Angels' garments were long, white, and shining. Garments for priests were of finest white linen. They had to wear these garments to come into God's presence to praise Him. They were to enter His gates with thanksgiving in their hearts and praise on their lips. So what is a garment of praise? I want you to think of it as a spiritual garment, a garment for your soul, a garment for your your spirit, a protection for your spirit. He says in verse 3, he says, put on a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So it's the opposite of despair, right? A garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. I like this verse in Psalm 107 where David says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. What does that word, oh, mean? What does that imply? Is He saying, Oh, if you'd only understand this. Oh, if you'd only do this. If all these men out here, if they'd only praise the Lord, what difference it would make in their life. We're going to look at some of those differences this morning. If we just praise the Lord. Oh, oh, if you just get it. If you just understand the benefits of praise. Oh, if you just put on the garment of praise. You know, Jesus gave us a model when he prayed um, the Lord's Prayer. He started out with praise. He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He started out with praise. So let's look at about five or six different things this morning about praise. About when we come to God and we praise Him, what it does. What takes place when we do that. The first thing is, I believe is the obvious, is praise helps us remember God's blessings. Psalm 103 says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Praising God just helps us remember what God has done for us. You pray before a meal. You thank Him for the food. He helps you remember that really God is the source of all blessings. Everything that we have that's good comes from God. That's what the Bible says. So you need to do that every day. And praise helps us remember God's blessings. Number two, praising God precedes the presence of God. I want to take you back to the Old Testament. Remember the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was the place where uh, this beautiful Ark that they had made that was all overlaid with gold. Inside it were the, the tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments in them. On top were the cherubim. And right under the cherubim was called what was called the mercy seat. And when that thing was in the, in the tabernacle, it says God's presence was right there on that mercy seat. <clears throat> well, there was a case where they were moving the ark and they were bringing it up to Jerusalem. And David told this to the, to the people in, or in 1 Chronicles 15. He says, He told the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brothers as singers to sing joyful songs accompanied by musical instruments, lyres, harps, and cymbals. These went before the ark into Jerusalem. And they were to march before this ark. And they were singing and they were praising. They were praising God as they took this ark, which represented the presence of God, up into Jerusalem. Okay, let's go forward a few years. David had, was getting old. He had appointed his son Solomon to be king. David had a dream about this magnificent temple that Solomon was to build. David is giving instructions to his son on, on how to build this temple. He had gotten some of the things together for this temple and gotten prepared for this temple. And, uh, you know, when I was in Israel, we were at 
at um, Jaffa, there's a port in Jaffa, and, and it's believed that, well, in fact, the Bible says, they, they cut cedars in Lebanon, and they floated them down to this port in Jaffa, and then took them across land up to Jerusalem to help to build the temple. Um, cedar wood they used in part of it. And David had started that process. There was a lot of things that he had done. Then he gives this order to his son. It says, the Levite priests, 30 years old or more, were counted, and the total number of men was 38,000. David said, of these, 24,000 are to supervise the work of the temple of the Lord, and 6,000 are to be officials and judges, 4,000 are to be gatekeepers, and 4,000 are to praise the Lord with the musical instruments I provided for that purpose. Now, isn't that the biggest praise band ever? 4,000 in the praise band. Wouldn't that be awesome to hear? Can you just imagine? And David says, I've already provided these musical instruments. He already had all these musical instruments made for this praise band. And I can imagine them encircling the whole temple and praising God. Why? Because praising God precedes the presence of God. The biggest praise band ever. Psalm says, But thou art holy, O that thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Inhabit. Inhabit means to dwell. I inhabit my house. I live there. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. When you praise God, he inhabits those praises. <clears throat> Now, let's fast forward a few more years. In the New Testament, God no longer exists in buildings. In the Old Testament, his, ma his presence was manifested in the tabernacle, later in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, by that Ark of the Covenant that was in the temple. The priest had to go once a year into there. He had to cleanse himself. He had to wear a certain kind of clothes. And he had to go in there once a year. He was your representative uh, to God from the people. But in the New Testament, when Jesus was crucified, that curtain was torn. It was, we have access for everybody to go into the, the temple now, to go into the Holy of Holies. Everybody has access directly to God now. First Corinthians says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. You're a temple. Can you say it? I'm a temple. I'm a temple. Okay? You are God's temple. God wants some praise in his temple. He wants some praise in his temple. When we praise him, it ushers in the presence of God into our temple. <clears throat> Now, that's why we have a time of praise every Sunday morning. We're putting on our spiritual garments of praise. And, you know, Jesse and Jeff are up here not to put on a show, but to lead you in worship, to help you to worship. You might say, well, I'm not a good singer. Nobody cares, okay? The people beside you can't hear you anyway. Only God can hear you, and He made your voice. You think He don't? He cares if you can't sing? Give Him some praise. Give Him some praise. Ushers in God's presence. It changes the way you think. <clears throat> Psalm 100 says, Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. Now think about the words you're singing. Blessed be your name when you're singing praise to God in the land that is plentiful and so on. See, praising God ushers us into the presence of God, but it does more than that. It does more than that. Praising God silences the enemy. It silences the enemy. Psalm 8 says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Who is God's foe and avenger? It's Satan. 
Satan and his legions of demons. So you mean praising God silences Satan? Yeah, it does. That's right. You know, you have to understand we're in a spiritual battle. From the second you are born until the second you die, you're in a spiritual battle. There's this war that's going on. God and the Holy Spirit want to guide you to do what's right. Satan and his legion of demons want to influence you to do what's wrong. They're out to devour you, the Bible says. The devil's like a roaring lion out to see who he can devour. It's like the old Indian was trying to explain to a younger Indian one time about life. And he said, you know, he said, my life is like this. He says, I've got two dogs. I've got a white dog on my right shoulder and I've got a a black dog on my left shoulder. And they keep whispering in my ear telling me what to do. The white dog tells me to do good things and the black dog tells me to do bad things. And so the young man asked him, well, which one wins? And the old Indian said, the one I feed the most. The one I feed the most. What are you putting in your mind? If you're putting in praise to God. See, what comes out of the mouth also goes in here. If you're putting out praise to God, you're feeding the white dog. You're feeding good stuff into your mind. And the black dog loses. See, praising God silences the enemy. When you're praising God, the voice of the enemy can't get through. But praising God doesn't just silence the enemy. Number four, praising God destroys the enemy. It destroys the enemy. When God was giving instructions to the children of Israel, he said this. He said, when you go into battle in your own land against an enemy who is oppressing you, sound a blast on the trumpets. Then you will be remembered by the Lord your God and rescued from your enemies. Now, why did he tell them to do that? To sound a blast on your trumpets. You know, you'd think you'd want to sneak up on your enemy, right? But he said, sound a blast. Give some praise. What did he do when they uh, walked around the walls of Jericho? He told them... uh, you know, sound a blast on your trumpet on that seventh day. And the walls came tumbling down. You know, Jericho, we was in, when we was in Israel, there's a city of Jericho there today. But the original Jericho, our guide told us, they've never found any evidence of the city of Jericho. It was totally destroyed. Okay, usually they find some bricks or something from all the cities in the Bible and everything. But Jericho is totally gone. Totally gone. God destroyed it. Um, Because praising God destroys the enemy. See, sometimes, or should I say often, the Satan comes up and he, he, he sets up territory in your life. He sets up a base of ob. Uh, operation in your life. He brings derogatory thoughts or evil thoughts into your mind. If you let him, he'll build a base of operation there from which he can destroy your life. How do you combat that? You combat it like David did in Psalm 9. He says, I will be filled with joy because of you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. My enemies turn away and retreat. They are overthrown and destroyed before you. 2 Corinthians tells us the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Why is praise so effective? In the spiritual realm, why is praise so effective? When Satan comes along and he sees we have the garment of praise on, why is that so effective to protect us from the enemy? I believe it's because of this, because Satan was once a beautiful angel. He was called Lucifer, the bright and morning star, he was called, the angel of light. His job and the legions of his followers was to praise God. He was in heaven for who we don't know how long, praising God. That was his job. But Satan got proud, and God hates pride, and he... Basically kicked Satan out of heaven, kicked him to the earth. And he also created something for Satan. The Bible says he created hell for Satan and his demons. Satan knows he's going there. 
He knows there's no redemption for a fallen angel. But he wants to take as many people with him as he can. And he also knows when we praise God, he can't stand it. Because that was his job. He can't stand when we praise God. When we put on that garment of praise, that's our protection against the enemy. It would be amazing to see into the spiritual realm and see what's going on. We could see what's going on in this room right now. There's angels. I hope there's no demons, but there may be. And there's things going on in the spiritual realm all around us, all the time. It would be amazing to see that. We see little bitty glimpses of that sometimes in the Bible. Sometimes God opens up a window and lets us look into the spiritual realm just a little bit. One of those times was in the book of Daniel when Daniel was praying. He was praying for his wisdom and understanding. He says for three weeks he prayed. No answer. Have you ever done that? You pray and you pray and no answer. Nothing happens. He prayed and prayed. No answer. For three weeks. Finally. Finally an angel came to him. And he said this, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me twenty-one days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, because I was detained there with the king of Persia. The king of Persia, the prince of Persia, was a territorial... Um, demon obviously that was in that particular area which by the way is Iran today he said he resisted me he kept me there but notice Daniel persisted for 21 days he kept right on he kept right on praising God he kept right on praying and finally the answer came through and he'll do that for you he'll do that for you that's why we don't stop praying we keep praying we keep praying because there's a battle going on in the spiritual realm. Number five, praising God opens door, the door for miracles. Remember the story of Paul and Silas in prison. Paul and Silas are in prison. And the uh, Bible says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. You need a miracle in your life, try praising God. Now you think Paul and Silas felt like praising God? They're thrown into prison. They're awaiting trial the next morning. They could have been taken out and executed at any time. But they're in there praising God. Singing and praising God. And all of a sudden, an earthquake comes and the, the um, doors swing open. They could have run away. But they stayed and because of that, uh, the rest of the story is the jailer and his family got saved and got baptized. But praising God opens the door for miracles. And finally, number six, praising God is an act of obedience. You might say, well... I don't feel like praising God today. Exactly. Do it anyway. Just like Paul and Silas didn't feel like praising God in that prison. But they knew the power of praising God. And they did it anyway. See, if you go ahead and do it, the feeling will come later. Praising God is not just a feeling. You don't just do it when you feel like doing it. You do it, the most important time to do it is when you don't feel like doing it. When you get down the dumps, you get, you get, um, you know, things aren't going right. Put some praise music in your CD player. Get the right stuff going on. Sing along to some good praise music. It will change your attitude. See, because praising God is an act of obedience. Feeling has nothing to do with it. It's an act of obedience. Turn with me to Psalms 150. No, how should we praise him? What should we praise him for? It's the last chapter in the book of Psalms. You know, as we read through Psalms, there were times when David was up. There were times when David was down. 
There was times when David was happy. There was times when David was sad. There was times when he was victorious. There were times when he was defeated. He had every feeling, every emotion that we have. And he learned something throughout his life. And he sums it up in Psalm 150. When he says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Symbol, praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise. How important is it? It's very important. It's one of the foundations of the Christian faith is praising God. Putting on that garment of praise. Hebrews 13 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess His name. When we confess His name with our lips, when we confess through the songs that we sing, or just saying the words, confessing His, his name with our lips, it's powerful. It puts on your garment of praise, your spiritual pr- pr- protection. You know, some of you are going to go through this week and something's going to happen and Satan's going to tempt you. He's going to bring all kinds of evil thoughts into your mind. Maybe even suicidal thoughts. You know, at first you may have to force it. It may not come natural and you you definitely won't feel like praising him. But do it anyway. Do it anyway. Because remember, you are God's temple. Your body is God's temple. He wants some praise going on in His house. He wants some praise going on. If you want His presence to come into your house, you've got to praise Him. This morning we're blessed to have the opportunity to baptize David Cole. Now David, if I can just talk to you for a minute. Okay? Because getting baptized is the beginning of your journey. It's not the end, it's the beginning. You're going to need some protection as you go along. You're going to need some protection from some temptations that the enemy is going to bring your way. He's going to try to hit you harder than he ever has before. I guarantee you. He's going to try to bring you down. He's going to try to make an example out of you so other people around can say, Oh, look at that Christian. If that's what a Christian is, I don't want to be a Christian. You're going to need some armor on. Now, David, your nickname's Rocky. We're going to change your name this morning. Okay? You don't need to be a fighter anymore. You need the garment of praise on. You need that protection. Let God do the fighting for you. Let God do the fighting from now on. You just got to get your armor on. You got to start with that garment of praise and let God do the fighting for you. All right? Amen? Amen. Father, we just come to you. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for the protection that you provide for us if we'll just praise you. And, um, Father, we just lift up your name today. Thank you, Father that we don't have to go through this world with its many pitfalls and many temptations without any protection. But we can, we can go through this world fully clothed with that garment of praise. And you're there for us all the time. Thank you for that. Father, we, we just lift up Rocky to you this morning as we, he makes this new bold step in his life, saying to the world that I believe in Jesus Christ, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would help his testimony to just glow in the community. Guide and direct him in everything that he does. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.